Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. 
you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon, but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To uh, recap from last week, 
when we started the story of Joseph. Two dreams, two more than dreams actually, two revelations that must mean all of Joseph's family will bow down to Joseph, all his brothers, even his father. The brothers didn't like that, not one bit. Joseph was their father's favorite son, which didn't make them like Joseph to begin with. But with these dreams and Joseph's interpretation of those dreams, this was just too much. So although they wanted to kill him, Joseph's brothers ended up selling Joseph to Ishmaelite traders, who in turn sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And the reason they didn't kill Joseph outright had to do with the two of Joseph's brothers, Reuben and Judah. And we noted last week that a whole chapter in the middle of the Joseph story gets dedicated to Joseph's brother, Judah, Genesis chapter 38. And you were warned that if you read it, it's not a good story. It's the kind of story that you know makes your eyeballs pop out. But it's not just the, the content of the story that's problematic. It's why this story of Judah at all, smack dab in the middle of the Joseph story, which is seemingly much more important than the story of Judah. But we kept all of that in the back of our mind as we continued with the Joseph story, and we'll keep it in the back of our mind as we continue with the Joseph story today. Now, Joseph uh, did such a good job in Potiphar's house there in Egypt that he was set over the entire household until Potiphar's wife told a lie about Joseph and got Joseph thrown into prison. There in prison, Joseph interpreted the dreams, the, the actually more than dreams, the, the revelations that two of Pharaoh's servants had, his cupbearer and his baker. But it wasn't actually Joseph's interpretation this time as it was previously. This time, it was God giving Joseph the interpretation of these revelations. And it came to pass, just as God said it would, great for the cupbearer and not great at all for the baker. And the cupbearer went back to serving Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and promptly forgot all about Joseph. Two years go by. Joseph is still in prison, but Pharaoh has two dreams. But two more than dreams, two revelations, really. And no one can figure them out, which is when the cupbearer remembers Joseph and how Joseph interpret interpreted his dream, his, his revelation correctly. And so he tells Pharaoh about Joseph, and Pharaoh immediately summons for Joseph, who listens to Pharaoh's two dreams, two revelations, about seven cows being eaten up by seven skinny cows, about seven ears of corn being devoured by seven diseased ears of corn. And God gives Joseph the interpretation that these two are really one. And they mean there will be seven years of plenty of food. But after that will be seven years of famine. And during those seven years of famine, it will be just like the previous seven years of abundance never existed. But if you plan now, Joseph said, if you plan now, you can store up enough grain during the seven good years so that there will be enough and more than enough to get your people through the seven bad years to come. And that's where we left off last week. So what did Pharaoh do after hearing all this from Joseph? Well, probably quite surprisingly to Joseph, Pharaoh makes Joseph second only to himself in all the land of Egypt. Now, he had just come from jail, and now he's the vice president, if you will. And Joseph begins to implement a massive plan to store grain throughout the land of Egypt during the seven years of plenty. And those seven years of plenty happen exactly as Joseph said they would, as God said they would. But now those seven years were over, and the seven years of famine began, exactly as Joseph and God said they would. And the famine 
was not just in Egypt. It was all over the known world, reaching all the way up to Canaan, where Joseph's father and brothers and all of their families were. But word spread to them that there was food in Egypt. So go, Jacob told his sons, go down to Egypt and buy us food so that we can live and not die. And so all of Jacob's sons head down to Egypt, all of them except Joseph's biological brother, Benjamin. Jacob doesn't send Benjamin. He's already lost Joseph. He won't lose Benjamin as well. And so the ten brothers go to Egypt, and they bow down before the governor of the land, the one who sells grain to all the people who come. And the governor of the land happens to be Joseph. They bow down to Joseph. It looks like Joseph's dreams from way back are starting to come true after all. But that doesn't seem to make Joseph feel better about the situation of seeing his brothers again, who, by the way, did not recognize him as Joseph, even though Joseph recognized them. One way Joseph kept his brothers in the dark was by pretending he needed to use a translator to speak with them, all the while able to understand his brothers perfectly. And he accused his brothers of being spies, which they weren't. They were honest about it. They were there to buy grain so that their families could live. But Joseph kept the spy accusation going. Joseph, by the way, is not just having a laugh with his brothers. This is a deeply conflicted part of the Joseph story. Because here are the people who wanted him dead standing before him. And later on, we learn a bit more of the, of the initial story than we did. We learn that Joseph begged with his brothers for his life. He didn't silently go along with their plans and hop into the pit. Joseph pleaded with his bro brothers, pleaded for mercy. And they showed him none. So why should he now show mercy to them? Suffice it to say, a lot is going on with Joseph at this point, and the brothers let slip that there's another brother still at home, Joseph's brother Benjamin. And Joseph demands, as proof of their innocence, that they are, they are not spies, that Benjamin must come down to Egypt. And one of the brothers can go back and fetch Benjamin, while the others wait here in jail. But for three days, he puts all the brothers in jail probably the same jail Joseph had been in all those years. But after three days, Joseph reverses himself and says, now all the brothers can go back and get Benjamin, and only one brother has to stay in jail. And the unfortunate one that gets chosen to stay in jail is Joseph's half-brother, Simeon. So with Simeon in prison, the other brothers return to their father, Jacob, and all the while, the Joseph shenanigans continue. But we're going to leave them to one side for the time being because the brothers have to convince their father Jacob to let them return to Egypt with Benjamin in order to retrieve their brother Simeon. But Jacob won't allow it. He won't let Benjamin go back with them. And so Reuben says to his father Jacob, remember Reuben? Reuben who kind of, but not really, kept his brother Joseph from getting killed by his other brothers. It's Reuben who says to his father Jacob, you may put both of my sons to death if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. Entrust Benjamin to my care, and I will bring him back. Now, on the one hand, that sounds, I guess, kind of noble, what Reuben says, but if you think about it, I mean, it's not very nice. I mean, what is this supposed to do? You know, Jacob, if, if we lose your son Benjamin and he doesn't return, you can kill two of your grandsons. It will make you feel better. You know, kind of makes you wonder what Reuben's sons must have thought of their father, you know, after their father said that to their grandfather. But Jacob won't allow Benjamin to go. So they don't go back to Egypt, at, at least not right away. I mean, despite all the mess that happened from their first trip down to Egypt, they had at least acquired some grain to eat. But now that grain was gone. And so they would have to go to Egypt again if they wanted to survive. And again, 
The plan, J Jacob's plan, was that all the brothers were to go, all except Benjamin. But this time, it was Judah who said to his father Jacob, remember Judah? He who also kind of saved his brother Joseph, he of the notorious chapter 38. It was Judah who said to Jacob, we can't go without Benjamin. The man, being Joseph, the man said, you won't see my face unless I see your brother's face. And Judah said to his father Jacob, send Benjamin along with me and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. Reuben said, let Benjamin come with me, and if Benjamin doesn't come back, you can kill my sons. Judah says, let Benjamin come with me, and if Benjamin doesn't come back, it is my life that is forfeit. I will bear the sin of this. And you can do what needs to be done to the one who bears this sin. To me. This is very different than what Reuben said. And for those of you who read chapter 38, this is a very different Judah than the Judah of chapter 38. He's grown a bit since then. Well, Jacob finally relents, and Benjamin goes to Egypt with the brothers. They, they again come before Joseph. They again bow down to Joseph. They again don't recognize him. And Joseph continues his game playing. And you'll, you'll have to read the story. It's there in chapters 43 and 44. But Joseph frames Benjamin for the theft of a precious cup belonging to Joseph. And because of this, Joseph says to his brothers, this one who stole the cup, Benjamin, he will become my slave. The rest of you, you're free to go. And it's then that Judah, Judah, who had said to his father Jacob that he would take on the blame, the sin, if Benjamin did not return, Judah stood up and said to Joseph, My Lord, please do not do this. If this boy, Benjamin, and actually uh, Benjamin wasn't quite a boy anymore, he was probably 35 years old at this point, if this boy, Benjamin, does not return, it will be the end of my father. I guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let me remain as your slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. I will take his place so that my father may live. And then happens what we heard Callie read for us this morning. After what Judah said, Joseph can no longer control himself. And he reveals to the brothers that he is Joseph, which gives a mighty fright to the, to the brothers who wonder what's going to happen now, to which Joseph says, don't be afraid. You did a bad thing to me. But God has been faithful even when you were not. And through this evil you have done, God was able to work good. You wanted to take my life, but I was sent here to give life, to bring life to all the peoples of Egypt, to all the peoples everywhere, even to bring life 
to you, my family. And thus, the long, slow process of family reconciliation begins. Joseph sends them all back to fetch Jacob and the rest of their families, and they tell Jacob that Joseph is alive and who he is. And of course, Jacob has a hard time believing all this, but they all move back to Egypt. The 12 tribes of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel, they all move down to Egypt and live there together and begin to grow into a mighty nation, many in number. And as Jacob nears death, there in Egypt. He summons all of his 12 sons to give each of them a final blessing. And now for some of them, their blessing is not much of a blessing. But you can imagine the blessing for Joseph, the blessing for Joseph is, is effusive. It's fantastic. But Jacob gives a rather unexpected blessing to Judah. Jacob says to Judah, Judah, your brothers will praise you. They will bow down to you. You are like a lion, the lion of Judah. The ruler's staff will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs. And the obedience of the nations is his. That dream, that dream that Joseph had, Joseph thought it was about him, everyone bowing down to him. But maybe not. Maybe they weren't bowing down to Joseph. They were bowing down to Judah. Judah was now the leader of the family, if you will. The one who was willing to bear the sins of another, to give his life for another. This is the one to rule. And the ruler's staff will never depart from Judah. Judah the lion. The one who rules by giving it all away, even himself. Many, many years had passed, and there was a man named John who had a dream, but much more than a dream, a revelation, really. And he wrote it down, and we find it now at the very end of our Bible in what we call the Book of Revelation. And in that revelation, John says that he saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll, sealed with seven seals. But there was no one found in heaven or on earth or under the earth who was worthy to open the scroll and break its seal. And John wept bitterly because of this. But then it was said to John, do not weep, because look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, it is he who has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. But when John looked, he did not see a lion, he saw a lamb a lamb, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Slaughtered lambs don't stand, but this one does, because this is the one descended from the line of Judah that was the lion of Judah, the one who did what Judah was willing to do, to bear the sins of another, to give himself for the life of another. And so when John looked to see the Lion of Judah, 
he beheld the Lamb instead. He beheld the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one who is worthy to rule. This is the one who gives himself for the life of the world. And John saw everyone bow down to him. The lion is the lamb. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The gift of forgiveness surpasses our understanding. It heals relationships and mends our wounds. In thanksgiving for God's unfailing love, we offer our prayer, responding, Lord, hear our prayer. That the leaders of the nations may maintain justice that leads to peace and harmony that leads to abundant life for all people, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the humility to receive God's blessings and the willingness to be a blessing to others, especially those who are lost and afraid, ill and without hope for recovery, mentally fragile and without friends, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For teachers preparing for the school year that is ahead, that they may be inspired to patiently nurture the minds of those in their charge. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may be a people of gratitude, giving thanks to God with our whole heart 
and soul and mind. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may not succumb to the harmful temptations of our culture, the desire to possess things beyond our need, our misuse of intimacy, our reliance on drugs and alcohol to improve our lives, and all things that keep us from trusting the power of the Spirit, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may set our sight on the new life that awaits all who live in hope, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. That the dead who have died in the faith of Christ may inherit the kingdom prepared for them, and that those whose faith was known to God alone may receive divine mercy, let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. In the company of all the saints, let us continue our prayers. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer, and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, bring you unto everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace to all you folks in the nave, peace to you folks in the transept, peace to anyone that may happen to be out in the courtyard or in the Preston Cutler room or in the nursery or in the playground, and peace to all you folks who are worshiping with us online. Wherever you happen to find yourself, please be seated. So good morning, welcome to Christ Church. It's great to see you all here on this late summer Sunday. Uh, and uh, last Sunday, we had a great time at the parish picnic. So special thanks to Catherine and LaVon Mignotten for hosting us yet again. That was awesome. Really appreciate it, and thanks to everyone who helped out uh, as well. So thank you uh, for, for, for uh, making it happen. It was really fun. It looked like, it, you know, this was the rain date, and when that last Sunday started, it looked like it was going to rain, and then it just it got sunny and it got hot. So I'm so thankful they had that pool there. So that was, that was great. Uh, so thanks again to the Mignottons. 
Uh, lots starting to come up here uh, at Christ Church, so please take a look at your parish life notes. Uh, the program season will be kicking off on September 10th. Um, I have started, uh, my, as I said uh, last month, I start, have started walking around town and inviting our neighbors to, uh, to church. I've already given out 100 flyers and have had some really fun conversations, interesting conversations. And uh, so I'm going to let you know the streets that I visit so that if you know someone on that street, you could follow up at some point you know, and say, hey, uh, I wanted to invite you to church and I heard you've met you know, Father Patrick, and he didn't have two heads, so why don't you come to church? So, um, and, uh, uh, but no, but seriously, it, it's a way for you to uh, follow up with someone that you might know that you've been thinking about uh, and who would certainly benefit from being part of the community here at Christ Church. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Be good unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.